So my name is Christo Borisov. I work at Teleric. Uh, my role is uh, product manager. I'm uh, spending my time leading the backend services team and some of the Teleric platform core teams. So what the Teleric platform core means, pretty much this is the, the pieces you see how all the products are integrating within the single platform. Um, this is how we call the platform core. So I have been uh, in Teleric for about eight years. Uh, I started um, still in the university back in my sophomore year, and I joined Teleric for three years as a developer. So I have pretty fair amount of development background. Then I moved into product management, and this is how I ended up in the platform. So today, what I'm going to talk about is mostly about how you can build mobile apps in an offline mode. And it's important to know that whatever I will be presenting today is tightly integrated within the Teleric platform. So the platform is available at platform.teleric.com, and those of you who haven't signed up can sign up and see all the samples that I have done and run them pretty quickly. So let's dive into the um, session today. Uh, the first thing I want you guys to think about and to remember from, from this session is that you cannot build any successful apps without robust offline capabilities. And the problem with offline is that, I, uh, you know, working as a product manager, I know that a lot of people, I know how requirements are being done for any kind of product. And for me, one of the nasty requirements that you can get is the one that you either get in the end of the project, like you shipped all the things that the client wanted to, or there is a requirement that the customer never told you about. He was just expecting that this thing is there. And he's like testing your product, testing the app, and then he's like, isn't this working offline? Um, how come it's not working offline? And the problem with this thing is that in order to make an app to work offline, you pretty much have to think about this in the very beginning of your development. You have to think about how you can build this offline, uh, how you're going to benefit from the local storage of the device, how you're going to uh, persist the items, how you can synchronize them when there is connectivity. And often those are uh, hard problems to solve. And especially if you have already built a large code base for your mobile app, and you have based it on tools that are not supported or not supposed to be uh, using um, supporting those capabilities, it might be a, a, a very tricky challenge. So one of the important things about offline is that you know, it's all about experience. It's all about making the user feel and like uh, the, the experience of your application. Here we have the Spotify um, application, which allows you, for example, to play music offline. Uh, and there are a, a number of scenarios that are required for customers. They're simply expecting that this thing is working offline. And they will be really devastated to hear that they, for example, purchase an, uh, um, let's say, um, um, some kind of uh, album and they cannot listen to the on the airplane. The other thing is you have your app should be also responsive with the internet connection. And responsive, not like responsive web, but just being able to uh, work uh, and your app, this is, for example, Outlook app that says that the connection is offline, but you still have, can do a lot of the major stuff. So you can go and search for the app, you can filter it, you can even write an email, which will be sent later. And, you know, for a lot of developers, uh, you know, we have to understand that offline is not just sending a message to the customer that he doesn't have internet connection. You know, the chances is he's already aware that he doesn't have internet connection. And he simply wants to go and do something with the app that you're giving him. Um, also, it's about performance. So if you think about all the benefits you get uh, from offline, you also get uh, you safe on the round trips to the server. Uh, you have a much more responsive um, application. No need to go each time to the server, uh, download those images, and so on. Uh, and this is especially important in mobile because if you're building, let's say, a consumer app, uh, you know, people want to use consumer apps that use less and less internet so that you're not draining their uh, bandwidth. But uh, before we jump and talk about how offline works, let's first of all break it down on several important components. Uh, so what exactly is offline? How does it work? How does it implement it? Uh, how is it implemented, and all the, all the things that we have implemented specifically in the Teleric platform that you're going to see in a couple of minutes. So first of all, the building blocks of an offline solution are compromised on a couple on four main things. The first one is 
it, when you're offline, you have to have some kind of an offline data storage that you need to support your device. We're going to cover in a bit um, all the different uh, scenarios you have for when you're writing a native app, a native script app, when you're ri uh, writing a hybrid app, and when you're uh, simply uh, writing a web application. You know, they have different storage mechanisms, and you have to understand all the options that are available for you because they require different scenarios. Then synchronization. So when you get to the point that you want to push some data, the, 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 the consumer did some operations in the mobile app, you need to synchronize this with the server. And to do this synchronization, oftentimes you need to think about, because apps are most of the time distributed systems, you need to think about conflict resolution. So if multiple clients are working on the same item and somebody has updated the item before you, what are you going to do with this? You need to solve a conflict, a conflict of the data. And there are different strategies to solve this. Um, we will cover some of these today. And the last thing is caching. Uh, so oftentimes when you have, when you're working with an app, you can either make all the items offline or you can simply say, I want to make specific content types or a specific a piece of my data to be uh, cached. Which means that, for example, if you're working with a lot of data that is coming for, uh, for uh, that is not that often refreshed, let's say the cities or the countries, uh, let's say the cities that are in, um, um, here in America, you can say, okay, those cities are not updated every day. I need to update them every 24 hours. So what you can do is simply say, in, um, let me retrieve the cities, and I want those to be updated in every 24 hours, which means the first time you s download the request, they're going to be stored offline. And in the next 24 hours, when you're making requests, those will be returned from the local storage instead of the server, right? Because there is cache. So we're going to look at these items a little bit more. So first of all, for the offline data storage, the important thing, as I said, is to think about and, and to understand what are the different uh, storages that you have. For native apps, of course, the best local storage that you can use is the file system, right? You have a device, you have access to the device, storage and you can use the, the storage of the device to put your data there. For web apps, pretty much uh, you have uh, the choice to use the browser. Uh, the limitation though with the browser is that you have up to five megabytes where you can store your data, right? It's not that robust. For hybrid apps, you have both, right? Uh, you, can, you can use the browser, which is five megabytes, or you can, uh, using the file system plugin, you can get to the point to use also the, um, the storage of the device. And then you don't have any kind of a limit or cap on the, on the number of items. Synchronization, um, you can synchronize the data between the client and the server at any given point, and uh, there are different strategies. So the solution that I will be showing today, uh, I'm, we are not going to get to the point where we are going to see the conflict resolution, but uh, pretty much what we are supporting is three different strategies. The first one, which is by default, is client always wins which means is the latest thing you have on the device is going to override the items on the server. When you have server wins, it's obviously if somebody changed the item before you on the server while you have been uh, updating it locally, it is going to uh, disregard your changes and discard your changes and it's going to take the server version. Or you can do a custom one. So pretty much you can put your own custom function straight into the JavaScript on the client side, get both items and based on your own logic, decide which one should be stored at the server. Uh, here is the slide for that. The caching, as I said, ability to cache the client specific expiration date. Uh, you can do, uh, as I said, the, the example was for countries. It, this can be a very good performance boost for your application so that items that you know that are not changing often can be easily cached at the client. Uh, there are a lot of things that you need to consider when uh, choosing an offline storage. As I said, you have to uh, understand whether your app would be requiring offline or not as early as possible in your requirements phase so that you can prepare for this. Uh, some of the things you need to make sure uh, are you need to consider what kind of a storage mechanism is available to you. Is this going to be uh, able to do the job? Often if you have a big requirements as we talk about uh, a client here, they have a requirement, for example, to store 800 megabytes of storage on their device, right? And to store this, you have to make sure you have the right tools to that. And uh, choosing the right technology is also important at that stage. Encryption, uh, a lot of times when your data is on the device, a lot of requirements are saying, hey, this data should be encrypted. 
Uh, and having a robust encryption and mechanism that can encrypt this data is also essential. Uh, Plays nicely with your server. Of course, a lot of the offline solution will require some kind of a way to understand whether the data of the server has been changed. Uh, whether it is some kind of a checksum or it's some kind of a date or a version field, there are many different strategies that we need to implement. But the best tools that we have seen that work best with the server are the ones of the client that don't require any changes at your server. Are the ones that can easily work and make sure that whatever server you have, if you have a meet a very minimum requirements, they can work with uh, with your uh, product. Um, of course, can be easily integrated in your client. It should place nice. It should be able to uh, fit in your scenario, and it is very very important that you have to also make sure that all components are ready for offline. So to give you an example, let's say I'm um, consumer app. I'm deciding to to do offline. And I have a lot of components that are by default requiring an internet connection. For example, analytics. I might be gathering information for my application. And if you don't choose your components wisely, this information will be lost. So for example, in the Teleric platform, we have our product Teleric Analytics, which allows you to track things like exceptions, features, usage, sessions, and all the things that you expect from a mobile app. And to be able to track this robustly, what we are doing is, we have our own storage mechanism behind the scenes that is storing the information. And if the app is offline and you're still using it, and when it's online, it's pretty much synchronizing automatically for your door changes. So we have to ju just check your dependencies and make sure that wherever you have as a dependencies to the internet, these, these items are uh, compatible and can easily be made to work offline. Or you will be simply um, have to you know, put an exception handling around them and make sure that they don't break the app. So let's talk a little bit about offline in the Teleri platform. So I'm really glad to introduce that today we're releasing uh, the offline capabilities in the Teleric backend services that you're going to see. These items are now part of our JavaScript SDK. And this JavaScript SDK has a support for both hybrid and native script apps. And the best thing about this thing is that you don't have to change almost anything in your existing apps to support offline. You pretty much have to just enable it and start. Uh, for native script, uh, we have uh, done, uh, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but the JavaScript SDK that we're using for hybrid in the backend services is 100% same API for native script. So whatever JavaScript you write, whatever JavaScript you write uh, as a hybrid, then you can reuse this in the native script if you need to transition apps or simply um, go and use it. Synchronization, synchronization uh, we, as I said, we support client-side, server-side, and custom. And we have a seamless integration with existing databases. And this is a huge, huge item because yesterday, as Burke was doing the keynote, he showed me how he can connect to a Northwind database and connect this to a web app. He, can also, he, he managed to do this because of the power of the data connectors that we introduced yesterday. Today, I will show you how you can connect to a data connector, uh, to an SQL server, get the data from this SQL server uh, into the backend services, and from then on, implement an, uh, an app that is using this, uh, um, this data and is synchronizing everything. OK, so uh, let's get to the demo. Can I ask one question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the database. There is no progress. There is no progress database? Yeah. So currently, the data direct drivers are supporting progress as a data source. Uh, it's supporting both Rowbase and OpenEdge. And those are things we will be adding throughout the year. As uh, Todd Anglin yesterday showed, we have just the four data connectors today that are supporting Microsoft SQL, Oracle, MySQL, and Postgre databases. And those are the, the, the ones that are supported and already available today with this release. Going forward, we plan to add things like Salesforce, SAP, and of course, the Progress uh, databases. Any other questions before we head to the demo? OK. So um, first of all, I will show you what I have uh, in the backend services. As most of you are not aware, the backend services as a, are a backend as a service solution. Um, there are a lot available today, but the main value proposition of the backend as a service is allowing you to create your content types or tables in the cloud and automatically expose RESTful services for you that you can go and consume, right? 
So we'll be using the backend services today to show how you can uh, build an app that gets the information from the server, brings it to the device, and then works in offline mode. So here I have our Northwin backend project. When you get to the project, uh, you can uh, see the types. So the types, you can think of them as tables uh, that pre pretty much hold our data. Uh, you can see that in the customers one, we have a couple of fields that are going to just load. So here we have a couple of items. We have a city, company name, contact name, and um, contact title. And of course, some default fields that you get. So what you can do with this backend here is you can, for example, add items, delete them, and so on. But the, more pow the, the most powerful thing about the backend services is that you can actually go and make and execute an arrest request to this and get the data. So for example, let's say we do API everlive.com v1, put our API key to identify the application, and put here customers. So once we do that, you can see not in a very well format, but we simply get the data in a JSON format. And here, with the uh, power of the UI, you can simply define those tables. So in our table today, we have um, six items. And now we are going to write a mobile app uh, that is going to consume those six items. So I'm here using uh, Visual Studio, the Visual Studio extension for Telerik App Builder, which is available as an option. And the first thing that I want to do is initialize our Everlife SDK. Uh, Everlife is the code name of the backend services because it used to be called Everlife and we never changed the API for backward compatibility. So what the Everlife is giving you is an abstraction on top of the rest of the layer that you just saw. So you can just go and say, hey, get me the customers uh, and filter them by this item. And it's going to return you a collection of these items without having you to deal with uh, AJAX requests or uh, writing your own. Um, service. So what I have done here is I have initialized the Everlife object, put here my API key, and here I will, it's very important for me this to be working over HTTPS so that it's secure. And here we have enabled the storage, the offline storage. And by default, um, it is working with the local storage. So pretty much defining the SDK, what we can do with this is um, uh, now we can simply hook up and get data from the server. To do that, as yesterday Burke was saying, we are trying really to integrate everything possible in, a, in uh, everything within Teleric in a most possible way. That's why we have here uh, a, need, a way to retrieve from the SDK directly a Kendo AI data source that you can simply use to bind it to a list view. Go ahead. Uh, is this native script? No, this is a hybrid one. But the API is the same in terms of the backend services. As I said, the backend services is 100% the same file. It's actually the same file. We're just checking whether it's in native script or not, and we're doing some switches behind the scenes for you. But this is a hybrid app. It should have no issues uh, with native script as well. Um, so here I'm getting a Kendo UI data source. And as you know, native script doesn't support Kendo UI because it is working with the native apps. That's why a native uh, controls. And that's why we're using Kendo here. So I'm just saying to Kendo, hey, Kendo, I'm going to be using the customer source. And um, I, want it, I want to bind this to a collection here, uh, which I want to show you. A very simple one. Uh, this resolution is not the best. OK. This is the Kendo I mobile view. And here we have a list view that just displays the contact name. So here we have, uh, we have uh, integrated with Angular. Uh, I'm showing here how you can do this with Angular. So we, we, we are simply tying the data source to the data source of the list view items. And when we run our app, oops. Okay. When we run our app, we should see simulator with the list items available for us. Here we go. So it just went to the server, get the JSON, and tied it to a Kendo source. Pretty straightforward. So we just have the list of items that were available at the server. So what we can do with the simulator is we have the bug options. And I'm going to start at the beginning to show you a couple of things. So this is the network. So I want you to guys to take a look at the network requests. So now if I go and add an item, and let's say I add a crystal um, session, and here I Oops. add the customer, what's going to happen is that this is going to make a post request 
and send this to the server, right? Which is very expected. Now, if we go to the back end, refresh this item, you can see that now we have seven items, uh, which is the one we just inserted. OK, so now let's uh, use the, one of the uh, nice things that the, the emul uh, simulator is giving us, our ability to change the connections for the device. So oh, this is not well optimized for this resolution. So here, once we, I will just switch this. Here we can just say, hey, we're not on Wi-Fi. Let's turn off the connection. Once we do that, we just get a notification here uh, that the app is working offline. So there is something that is happening behind the scenes. The first thing you need to, to, to implement is to make sure that your app understands when the internet connection is gone. So that from then on, you can start implementing any kind of a strategy you want to do. Uh, so to do that, uh, what you have to do is in Cordova specifically, you simply have to add to um, hookup for the event listeners for online and offline. So those are two events exposed by the file system plugin in Cordova, which allows you to, they are going to be fired off whenever the connection is online and offline, right? And, uh, you know, the Cordova plugin is very similar to the modules that you saw as a concept yesterday on the native script piece. So here, when you're online, we're simply saying to our um, Everlife services, go online. When we are offline, we're saying go offline. What the, this means is that when we say that we need to go online, we're simply telling to the backend services to make sure that it is instance is in online mode and that we know, want to synchronize everything right away. And the synchronization is on purpose not happening uh, automatically when you go online because you, want my, you might have different scenarios. You might have a button that says, OK, now I want to go and synchronize the data uh, 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 from the user interface. Going offline is pretty straightforward. You just tell to the instance of the backend services SDK, you are offline. And when you tell this to the backend services SDK, it is instantly switching from sending all the requests you're sending to it instead of the server to the local storage. So this is doing it behind the scenes for you. Um, what I'm also doing here is I'm sending a broadcast event that the network has changed uh, for online and offline so that I can show this small pop-up that you just saw that you're working offline. And this is totally disconnected and customizable. So it is up to you to implement the user experience you want for working offline. Um, OK, so now while we are working offline, uh, I want to also take a look at the network requests. Uh, so now. We're going to add an item, and this time would be Risto offline. And we're going to come here and add the item. And we can see that it is part of our collection. Uh, the app, uh, you just created the object. Uh, it is part of the app, but there were no requests happening right now, right? Because it didn't. We told the Everlife SDK to work offline. So it didn't have to go and uh, um, send the information to a server. It is currently persisting in the local storage. So now, when we go online again, what happened is that we just got the synchronization completed, uh, which is an event that we're using. And we saw that it automatically did the post request, because we said, hey, synchronize all the changes that we have done. And those are not just create operations. Those are full crude operations that you can do. You can create items, delete items, modify items, and uh, you don't have a limit on the, num uh, on the number of items you want to edit. So once you go and synchronize this, all those changes will be pushed to the live environment. Um, any questions to that? Pretty clear? Does it also download new stuff from the server? Well, when, when you are online, you can download. When you say offline, well, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to check whether the items are locally, uh, whether it has any uh, items locally. If it doesn't have any items locally, it's just not going to do anything, right? Because there is no internet connection. So what you have to ensure is if you know that the user will be using specific uh, types or collections, you need to make a get request to make sure when there is internet, he downloads the items. And from then on, you can simply work offline and still make queries to this collection and still make filtering, for example. But uh, it's going to be just from the local storage. It's right. not going to be fresh right. data. As soon as you go online, mm -hmm. right, does it download new stuff as well? You can instruct it to do. Uh, there is no setting for that, but it's no up to your. Automatic. No, no automatic. It's up to you because, for example, 
let's say I'm using an app. And for example, in Kendo UI, you have this feature that is pull to refresh, right? So you scroll down the list, and it is spinning, and it is uh, loading the new data. And for example, let's say I'm reading an item, and my connection goes offline and online, and then if we automatically do this, your list is going to refresh while you're reading the item, right? So uh, that's why we're giving this access to you, and depending on your scenario. I guess in terms of conflict, if you have the same item needed multiple times, it will do it in that same sequence. It will post the changes to the uh, online storage. So, so if you do multiple, so let's say you create an item, and you edit this item, it's going to simply send a single request with the item. The last one? The last one, yes. The one that you have just enabled. But what? This one, specifically because I'm running the simulator here, is the local storage because we don't have. It's five for megabytes. That's it. Yes. Simply, what you have to do is uh, here is our JavaScript SDK, and this is where you define your provider. And here you can say, hey, I want this to be the file system, and that's it. Right now, it's using simply the plain file system, but it has a way to encrypt the data. So it is a simple plain storage where we are storing the data in our form, own format. But looking uh, uh, in, the, in the roadmap, we are planning to add SQL if you have really huge amount of data. So let's say you have like two gigabytes, and you have to do really uh, robust queries there, and so on. So we'll be adding this in the next couple of months. Will the data store page against the uh, file system storage there, and is that file system storage indexed so that it is sufficient? Right now, there is no index. Uh, as I said, this is uh, well done for any kind of data, let's say up to 100, 200 megabytes, maybe. Uh, this is all the tests we have done, and they're pretty, pretty OK. Uh, going forward, we want to implement SQL Server so that this can be even more performant to that. Uh, there was one question here. So is there a life the SDK that's abstracting the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is abstracting both the SQL services and both the communication with the local storage and uh, the communication with the server. It knows that uh, it's offline? We just told it to. Uh, I, I, I said that uh, it is up to you to define, to tell the SDK when it's online and offline. And here, as I said, we're listening to the device events when it goes online and offline. And from then on, we just tell it, hey, go offline, right? You are offline. When you tell the SDK, the whole instance of the SDK that it's offline, it is constantly making sure that it works with uh, local storage. If I write an application with just Kendo UI, mm -hmm. do you have uh, JavaScript available? Um, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure. If I just use Kendo UI. Yes. So if you're using Kendo, offline, uh, Kendo UI and you connect it to your own RESTful API, you have an option also to use offline, the built-in offline storage of Kendo. Uh, the shortcomings are that it doesn't work with the file system, as I showed. And it doesn't have that robust mechanism for the conflict resolution that we have here, right? And you have to make sure that um, you have to pretty much take care on all these items for you. So conflict resolution should be done by you. Uh, file system should be, uh, is currently not supported, uh, and, and so on. I'm not sure that quite made previously. If you have like five changes, mm -hmm. does it uh, five changes to five different collections. If those well, are like say five records, right? You've created five new records there. Like it's going to be it's going to be a single request. Single request. Yes. Both for all of them. Yes. So let's let's take a look at that so that I am not talking nonsense. So let's clear the item. Let's go offline. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's add um, item. It's one uh, one item. No requests. Let's add another item. Right here. So we just added two items, and now when we go online. It just did a single post request. And we resulted, it, uh, we got a result with two items created and the IDs of the items that were created, right? 
So what we are doing is in the backend services, I'm not sure where you can see from the back, but in the backend services, when you, when you create an item, we are always returning uh, the ID of the item on the server that was created if you need to, to do something with it. Um, OK, so uh, the next thing that I want to show you is how this thing works with uh, SQL Server. Uh, and for, for this, we will be using the data connectors that are available and that we just released. So here, uh, I have my connection uh, collection, which is just customers. But uh, I want now to connect uh, to an SQL Server. And to do that, I'll get to the data connectors. And here, you can see that I will have an Oracle and a backup of the Node Twin database in case something goes wrong. So let's see our connection name is uh, Northwind SQL connector of type SQL server. So I'm just going to say, hey, I want this to be SQL server. And here you have to put a data link server. The data link server is something that you host within your premises nearby the, the SQL server so that you don't have to expose your SQL server over the wire because nobody is going to be willing to use that, right? And the data link service is making sure that it communicates with the SQL server in a um, secure way. So here we are going to add our data link server URL. And here is the connection string uh, for the north. OK. When we test the connection, oh, everything is all set. So now we have our connector. So when we go to types, we can say, hey, we want to create a type, but instead of storing it in MongoDB in the cloud, which is the, the default storage in the backend services, we want this to be coming from uh, uh, this one. Create a type from a data connector. And here you choose the connection, uh, the, the, the connector. So this one, this, I'm going to use the one that I just created. Here you can select the source. So uh, this time I also have customers, but uh, the customers that are stored in, in the database, and this guy Dimo is here as well. <laughs> He's still going wild with this. So here you can uh, choose the name, but customers is already used by the built-in one. So I'm going to name this uh, customer SQL, for example. And here I'm going to do the mapping, the fields that I want to get in my RESTful service from the SQL server. So I'm going to just say, hey, I need the city, company name, contact name, com uh, contact title, and the customer. Um, OK, not the customer ID. We might not do that. We need one. Let's say modify add. And this is required. So you need to have either modified add or created add, any kind of a date time stamp on which the, the item was last updated. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible for us to make sure that there is a conflict resolution. So if you want to make sure you want to use conflict resolution and to be able to uh, implement this, you need to have a modified add which has a date time type on the item's last change time frame. So once we do that, we should get the data straight from SQL Server available in the backend services. OK, here we go. So here we have 96 items. Um, we have uh, City Madrid, company name, contact name, and so on. So now if we go and do the previous request that we did a couple of minutes ago, API Everlife, but here we put customers SQL, we are going to retrieve the data coming straight from SQL Server with zero code. So no web API, no, no service tag, no code required to expose your SQL Server. Um, so you can do absolutely all the requests you expect from, from the, the, the client. So the best thing about the data connector is, is now when I go to the SDK, the SDK has no idea whether this data is coming from SQL server, file system, MongoDB, or uh, you name it, right? We have made sure that the server side has an abstraction that is simply abstracting the storage layer. So now when I go to my uh, application, I can simply go to the places where I'm defining the customer's table. And here I'm going to say, hey, get me a Kendo data source that works with the customer's SQL table. So once I do that, and come here and reload our data, what happened? Let's restart this one. Customer's SQL. <coughs> Something is. This thing is not being happy. OK. 
Okay, let's bring the backup. Uh, sorry. Okay, I have a second one here. Just in case something like this happens. Okay, this is our database. Um, let's get to the point where we have the customers definition. Mm, okay. Okay, here you go. So we just got the same collection, uh, and because we have the same entities, the same collections, everything is, is working. So now, uh, let's get the debug information. Here we can, again, go offline. Make sure that it's saying we're offline. Go and add an item, restore offline. Add the item as expected, no request to the server. Now we can go online. It just posted the request. And when we get to here and refresh our data, uh, we can see that we have 97 items. So the item was synchronized and it's straight in SQL Server. As simple as that. So no, no need to do any kind of uh, uh, you know, server side implementations. Pretty much can do UI, backend services. And our data connectors are uh, doing the heavy listing for us to, to get to that state. Um, so you have a number of capabilities that you can use. As I said, you have an ability to simply set the file system and the local storage. Uh, you also have a couple of nice events that we're exposing. So in order to make the UI as, uh, as nice as possible, we're exposing uh, events that you can hook to as part of the Everlife SDK, which are sync start and sync end. So whenever you call the sync method, whenever you want to synchronize the data, we are firing those events before and after the synchronization. So that you can show the UI that something is happening, show some kind of a spinner, or make sure the user is aware that data is being synchronized right now. Um, I think those are the, the main things that are uh, possible today. So I, I think this is mostly for the demo, and we can move to the Q&A. And of course, the rating that we have to expose. So, yeah, so here I haven't deal with security because my idea was to get to the offline. And, uh, you know, security on its own it has its own aspect so here you can simply enable user authentication and permissions so the permissions are built in and you can simply go and say the method hey you know people who have this role should be able to access it or person who has created can only uh, modify it but other people can just read it so the security is built in the backend services i have just stripped down this for the purpose of the demo but one of the benefits that we are adding right now uh, with the offline is that when you're authenticating your users to the backend services with a username and password, what you get is usually an access token. And the access token allows you to make the authentication. But when you enable offline, we're actually storing the, uh, the access token within the application. So the next time your user fires off the application, we already have the access token, so you don't have to pop him again uh, this kind of a screen and say, hey, log in again. Uh, you know, I can dive into the authentication, but uh, you know, I'll just let the other guys ask about offline. And if you want, we can talk about it outside. So you mentioned, you know, different uh, methods of conflict and synchronization. So it looks like what you're doing is find all the kids over there. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to sort of change the server always based on something logic, where do you do that? We'll just put a setting here. So I'll, let me just pull up the backend series documentation to show you exactly the API. It is just a simple setting. So here is our JavaScript SDK, offline mode. And, um, dead synchronization, offline mode. And so here is the strategies that I mentioned. And here is how you do it. On the offline, 
storage, you just say, hey, conflict, and here is by default client wins. But here you can say server wins, right? So you can just say server wins, and which means that automatically the server is going to be in it. And then you can just say a custom strategy. So here you can say custom, and then here you can pass your own function that you're going to be, uh, it's going to be involved when there is a conflict, and you're going to get both the item that is locally and at the server, and it's up to you to decide which one should be persistent. Uh, there is a question in the back, yes? Sorry, I can't hear from here. So what I meant is that, for example, let's say you create an item, right? Yeah. And the server still doesn't know about it. And you go and modify this item. O obviously, if, if it was online, it would be first a, you know, a post, post request, and then it would be a put request to update it. But since you're working on the client side, there is no need for us to remember what has been happening to this item while uh, the client. We just care the final state of the item. So when you go and modify the item, you're modifying it in local storage, then we simply issue a post request because we need to send a post request because it still doesn't have an ID and the server doesn't know about it. So, um, yeah, it needs to handle it. Uh, it needs to assign an ID to the item because it doesn't know about it. And it doesn't matter whether you have changed it 20 times on the server, you, you're pretty much changing your mind what this item should be created when there is internet. Sorry. Yes, we have cloud code, uh, so pretty much you can use it, execute your own JavaScript on the server side, and you can do it on your content type. So, for example, here we can execute logic before the item is created, after it is created, before it is edited, after it's edited. So we have eight pre-processing and post-processing hooks in which you can sign up and write logic. Um, I can pull up the UI here uh, quickly. So here is the backend services, and here we have. We need to just enable it. Uh, it is called Cloud Code, add to the project. And here is our Cloud Code Navigator. Uh, you can get to the customers. And here is the small ICQ screen. That's not visible from here. But here is the place where you'll be writing your code, or you can simply upload the code from App Builder and so on. But this is executed at the server side. No, just the changes, just the changes. So we are tracking all the changes you are making to the to the device. So yes, uh, and uh, we are trying to optimize uh, not only to send the changes but to send them in single requests. So the create for a single item in one, the uh, changes in another, and so. On. Yeah, you finish it. Well, it depends. I mean, if you if you uh, say get request, it's going to push down. But if an item has been modified locally, right? I'm talking about server, some other uh, uh, user mm -hmm. who's tried to uh, handheld modify something and put it up to the server there. Yeah. Will the other handheld get that change as well? Well, you, no. It is uh, currently done with RESTful services, and uh, there are no sockets. Uh, for this, we need a web socket that maintains a, a constant connection to the server so that changes are everywhere. Uh, currently, it is based on REST API, so you need to go and download this data on your own uh, to get to get it on. You can just get the changes. Uh, this is the caching, yeah, but the caching is still not here. It's coming pretty soon. Uh, Yeah, for example, in this case, what we sent is we made a single post request, but the payload contained two items. Right. And that's why when we get the server the information, it said, hey, two items were created. Those are the two IDs, right? But if you had done a delete, then you would send a request to the server for the app yes. and a request to the server for the delete. 
exactly. And we also support, for example, uh, very advanced things like uh, deleting by filter. So you can, uh, which is very nasty if you forgot to put the filter, <laughs> you delete everything. But uh, you can do a lot of things. You know, you can update by filter, delete by filter, and so on. So those are supported. And those are based on the, uh, you know, Node.js and uh, MongoDB behind the scenes, so it's quite powerful. Uh, we are trying to use the MongoDB syntaxes and all the things that MongoDB allows you to do uh, straight away. Uh, and we have abstracted this in the JavaScript SDK, but if you need to connect it to, let's say, a command line uh, application, you can use the REST API, and it's going to be still working. Okay. Well, it depends on your strategy, right? So it depends on what you want to do. For example, the best way, in my opinion, if you have such scenarios, is to implement a custom one and ask the user who is, the, uh, who is doing the operation to do this, right? So you can say, hey, this item is gone, you know, create it again with the latest information I have, or, okay, if this is deleted, just disregard my changes, right? Uh, it's not the same ID. Hmm? The ID is different. Well, we know that this item at our... Hmm? No, I think it was deleted. Well, it, pretty much if you need to handle this, you can also implement also a server-side uh, strategy on that. But it will be a little bit more com complex. Going forward, uh, the idea is that uh, it, we might enable it to be possible to do conflict-side resolution on the server-side, which really allows you exactly those scenarios where you know what has been the, light, the latest state. But for a delete item, um, honestly, I haven't tried here. Uh, I think conflict resolution should be able to handle it nicely. The worst case is going to create it again. Uh, just check. But this is a good question. If I had a swag, I would give it to you. <laughs> Didn't bring anything. Uh, anybody else? No? Brushing for lunch? Okay, guys, thank you. Okay.